Welcome back. So after about five months of the COVID-19 induced lockdown of international shutdown of international flights, the federal government is finally set to reopen the flights today, September 5. An earlier date of 29 of August was announced before it was shifted to today. There have been all manner of reactions, some for good, some undecided as regards this reopening of the international wings of the airport. But let's look at the implications, the pros and the cons. And to help us, we have Taya Ojiri, who is an aviation consultant. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be here. Good. We're still expecting a tourism person and another aviation person. Hopefully, they'll come in before this segment ends. Um, so, Mr. Ojiri, so 29th of August didn't happen. Yes. But the 5th of September has happened. I, 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 I almost said it's likely to happen. <laughs> it's happened. Yes. Um, what's your take for one who's been in that field? Uh, it's, I'm still in that field. And what is happening, we're leaving it. It's a present reality whereby we've opened the airports to international, international airports to international flights today. It's a great relief with excitement and euphoria. Really? Um, yes, two airports for starters. Because um, two airports for starters... We have just Abuja and Lagos. We have uh, restrictions of 12, 1,280 passengers to be brought in daily. And then we just have huge compliance to COVID-19 protocols. Lots of implementations, lots of processes. But one should uh, emphasize at this point that in the next two, three weeks, a lot, a lot of moving parts. It's, there's lots of fluidity in the system. Mm -hmm. Lots of other countries that actually have uh, border closures, travel restrictions. So that's affecting us. That's going to affect the flights. And that's going to affect the way the next two, three weeks pans out. So it's a work in progress. It's something we're excited at. And it, as we start today, and uh, the full flight starts next on Monday, we actually see lots of international flights not flights from European Union, unfortunately, for now. The ambassador did mention that because uh, there are lots of closures in at these uh, countries where they're restricting Nigerians to come in. Mm -hmm. So there's a reciprocity clause, mm -hmm. which not, not allowing EU flights for flights to come, to come in either. So that's actually been discussed. But let me, let me interrupt you. You said yes. something about great relief. I am wondering why you use that phrase. What's the relief in opening the international flights? The relief in opening international flights, international flights for demography and statistics is actually a driver to domestic flights. Domestic flights, don't forget, opened on June, 20, June 8th. And with that, we've seen the slump in the number of passenger traffic. Our destination, our demography of passengers here, are what you call origin and destination passengers, is driven by business. Even though people have found other ways of doing business in the last six months, there's still need for face-to-face -face interaction. People family, uh, meeting family and friends coming over here. So that's how people uh, have to go travel for studies, people for health reasons. Lots of opportunities that are now opening up in the last five months that were not, uh, uh, that was closed down. So that's a good relief and is actually going to open a semblance of normalcy for the next few weeks. Okay, but in, in opening up uh, the airports for international flights, there's, yes, we talked about some restrictions. The number of passengers, for instance, um, we talked about 1,200 or thereabout passengers per day. Yes, per day. Brought in. So on the average, about 200 passengers per flight. Yes. Wouldn't that be detrimental to the businesses of the airlines? I mean, seeing that they have to carry less than the capacity of those planes. It will be. And like you said initially, this is just a start. This is actually what, what we actually, everybody calls a partial reopening. Two airports, restriction, so that we actually, we've seen in, with hindsight, with a lot of the evacuation flights, that those that were evacuated actually tested positive even after return. So we have to manage this. And again, it's been reiterated that aviation does not want to be that channel of vessel for spreading of COVID-19. That's the challenge and the perception people have about aviation. And we have to nip it in the bud and ensure that it's a safe channel, safe conduit for movement of business and services 
so that people get reassured and safe to travel again. So it has to be uh, gradual, quite gradually phased over time. And yes, it's painful. It's actually going to ensure uh, lead to high ticket cost initially. Be realistic if for two, because if you have a 250, 260 seater aircraft and you're only limited to 200 passengers, the passenger, the airline has to make a, a what you call yield, mm. commercial viability on that flight. It makes the ticket price go up. So okay. that's going to affect it initially, but this is not the new normal. And it's going to change eventually. Things are going to adjust, and we're going to see things pan out. Okay. The, that matter of passengers again, um, do you think it would be wise for the operators of this flight to have medical personnel amongst those they are carrying the planes? I mean, if they have to... Because I was having a conversation with someone yesterday, and he talked about the possibility of um, the laboratories within the airplanes being um, conduits for transmission. Yes. So that's a possibility. But so do you think it would be wise to carry medical personnel within the, the plane? There are two questions to that. The crew are well trained. The, true, the crew and uh, people within the value chain are actually well trained and exposed to the reality and COVID-19 protocols, which actually make sure the prevention part of it. But once you ensure, for the uh, medical uh, personnel to be on the plane, I think that would be too much cost to the airline. Mm. But once you, the, the protocols are actually done prior to boarding, that actually mitigates that process of spread and challenge, uh, and uh, spread within the air, airplane. And talking about the, uh, the washroom being a, a, a conduit, yes, there's a possibility, but we've identified that. And within the safe travel uh, protocol being implemented or being uh, initiated by ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, it did mention the sanitization process for the washrooms for long haul flights. It did mention the uh, sanitization process when the aircraft lands so that when there's a turnaround, it's well disaffected. Prior, there's the electromagnetic process that cleans out the aircraft prior to the reboarding process. So that actually disaffects and sanitizes the aircraft before the next flight. Okay, but a very simple question. Yes. How safe is it to board a plane at this point in time? It's very safe. It's been, uh, it's been, it's safe, and it's, it's been, uh, we have had simulations, we've had the processes, that's been a safe part of the safety process is actually you actually have one or two airlines internationally actually offering insurance uh, opportunities to passengers to ensure that that safety process is guaranteed. So mm -hmm. it's safe with the sanitation process, with the protocols, but like our viewers prior, uh, the presenters prior, it's a personal responsibility. Health declaration needs to be made prior to your travel, if you know you have a uh, mitigating health issue or uh, a, a personal health issue, you should not, you must not travel. You have to, health declaration is key. Being able to uh, comply with the protocols, with the uh, use of masks, mm. sanitizers, face masks, and even disinfectants throughout the process actually helps reduce that process. Okay, we've been joined by Isaac Balami, who's an aviation consultant from our Abuja studio. Isaac, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, real quick, so I'm, I'm sure you were, we were hearing Taya when he was talking about the how comfortable he is that the, the aviation sector is opening up. I'll be it partially, but gradually to open up, so it'll be going. But um, this matter of some countries restricting Nigerians from coming in, and so the Reciprocity Act is, is set is already in place based on the restriction to certain airlines to come into Nigeria. Um, how do you think that will work out for the industry? Well, you see, uh, I think Nigeria has now come of age, and. Uh, I really, really appreciate the leadership of the Minister of Aviation, Senator Hadi Surika, and our new DG, uh, Captain Nuhu, who I believe knows what he's doing. I mean, gone are those days where you throw rubbish at us and you want us as a nation to just keep quiet, sit down and look. Um, you don't want Nigerians to come into your country, even when the data is clear that even this COVID of a thing 
you know, you, 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 are, you, are, you are even more exposed than us. If you say we can't fly into your country, I see no reason why Nigerian government should also allow them to fly into our country. And I can sh assure you that based on what the Nigerian government has done, they are making serious efforts to sort that out. The UK uh, and other parts of the world has opened up their embassies, are open, they are giving out visas and everything. And some of these countries said Nigeria is on the ban list. And I think that is the way to go. Um, the ones that have given us access to their country, we have given them access to our, to our own country as well. And I stand with what the NCAA is doing. Okay, so the global community is happy about this, um, the opening of the aviation sector in Nigeria, but they are also cautioning that certain precautions should still be in place. Also, take into cognizance the fact that some of these other countries that had opened up earlier are bringing back the restrictions again. Shouldn't we be looking at that to even open up our uh, air airports? Well, you see, one good thing about the Nigerian airspace is even before we started the domestic flight, there was, I mean, there was a drill, right? And um, uh, we have successfully opened up our local flight. And I think the NCAA, the Nigerian Airspace Management Authority, the Federal Airport Authority, you know, led by the aviation ministry have done very well. If you travel locally, you will appreciate the effort of the aviation industry. Another issue also is we have been doing an evacuation flight for a long time. This is not the first time. And let me give you this information. Most Nigerians might not even be aware that the protocol, you know, you know the, the guideline itself, when there was a lockdown globally, Nigeria, even before the International Civil Aviation Organization or the European Union came up with the protocol, Nigeria was the first, the Nigerian NCA was the first to come up with that guideline that will protect passengers and even operators. And I can assure you that most part of the world copied from Nigeria. We've done so many evacuation flights, including ourselves. We participated with uh, one warmest air, even though we're trying to sort out some issues on that. But I can assure you that most of the evacuation flights that were done were done purely with the COVID-19 protocol, you know? And um, there is no fear whatsoever this is not something that um, is not as if this is the first time that aircraft will be coming into the country, even as at today, uh, sorry, as at yesterday, uh, by today again, there are still evacuation flights, and it's the same protocol. Uh, the NCAA is on top of the matter. Uh, the fan is also ready. I think they have demonstrated that over and over. And I don't think there should be any fear. I mean, a lot of Nigerians or other parts of the world, people are stranded, people need to reunite. Like uh, uh, Mr. Tayo did say, it is a personal responsibility. It's not just the government responsibility alone. As citizens, as a global citizen, anywhere you are in the world, it is your duty. You know yourself. If you have an underlying health conditions, you know what to do. Before you travel, you must do your test. And you know, while you are in the airport, you must observe. I mean, it's one thing for government to set the rules, you know, the guideline. It is also another thing for us to follow. You know, so we just need to comply. We just need to cooperate with the government and ensure that we are also safe because in trying to keep yourself safe, you are keeping others safe, which is very, very important. Okay, Taya, this um, matter of getting to the airport three hours before your flight. <laughs> I laugh because before, well, let me not say I laugh. <laughs> before now, before these restrictions came up, we've had issues with people getting to the airport on time the big men and even the small men. But now you have to get there three hours before because you have to go through all the protocols, the COVID-19 protocols, all the checks and all. Then you still have to go through immigration, then go through security before you, customs, before you enter the board. Do you think that is feasible? We, Using an airport like the Lagos airport, for instance. In reality, international flights, you re read your boarding ticket and your check-in process. Two hours. It is. Well, two, two hours. But what we've seen with the simulation with the domestic, we started with three hours, which was what, where that number came from. But two weeks after that, we realized we was moved to an hour, 30 minutes. Again, this is, some, this is an unprecedented issue. It's a lot of fluidity in the, uh, in the system, lots of moving parts. We've not found a vaccine yet. So three hours for starters is safe. However, what mm. is key 
are very pivotal for all of us is the fact that the new, the, what uh, uh, COVID-19 has actually opened up for us is the use of online checking being promoted. So once you check in online, it actually, you're reducing the person-to-person -person contact at the airport. We, uh, FAN is trying, the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria is trying to implement the self-checking process as well as the baggage uh, drop-off process. That actually re reduces your time at the airport and in contact with people. They also have the barrier uh, flexiglass uh, protection. All this actually helps with the, protect, uh, with the check-in process. But with the three hours, it's the stats for the, this new normal. Then after two, three weeks, we'll see how that pans out. And eventually, we'll see what works for everybody. But it's safe to be at the airport to get the process all done in good time rather than rushing to put the flights. Uh, Isaac, um, earlier, um, Taya talked about the evacuation, and you also mentioned the evacuations that have already happened. And one of those that was evacuated, at one of the returnees, a couple of days after he, he came back, it was discovered that he was COVID-19 positive. But that brings two questions here, but I'll ask them separately. First question is, with this new protocol of wearing your mask, I think that's one of the guidelines given, that you must wear your mask through the flight. And some of those flights might be six to 12 hours. Do you think that those passengers can bear that through that long haul flight? Well, I believe they can. You know, the aircraft is well pressurized, well ventilated. I mean, uh, it's not just, um, uh, uh, a tube where people just sit down. Uh, there are a lot of atmospheric activity in there. And the aircraft itself is designed to also take care of that. Most of those airlines also are also disinfecting their aircraft. You know, they spray some of those uh, approved um, 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 chemicals or what do you, or, or, uh, I mean, you know, on board just to keep people safe. But the most important thing is that, you see, is something that we have to live with. Nobody planned for this COVID. It has come, it has come, it is real. People are dying every day, people are sick. And we have to, if you spend six to 12 hours to keep yourself safe, why not? What will make anybody travel at this point in time is, must be very, very important. Most people have decided to just shut down until this whole drama is over. So if you are on board, I will recommend. If you know that you are not fit, you know, health-wise, to put on face masks for that number of hours, then you have to postpone your trip. But it's important that we adhere strictly, we obey the cabin crew on board, we put on our face masks from beginning to end of the flight. That is very, very important. I know it's tough for everybody, but it's something that we all have to cooperate with authorities and comply. It's for our own good. And that is just it. What you're implying is that some, a lot of people should not travel. Because there are some people that can't stand wearing their face mask for if more you, than 30 minutes. So why, sh if, I, if I cannot, but you see, and there are even different kind of face masks. You know, uh, our company Seven Step produces face masks. And the point is that some of those face masks are not even approved. You know, they're not proper. The, the breathability, the comfort is very poor. So if you're traveling, you need to get approved, you know, standard face masks that you know, has been approved by whether uh, the Nigerian SON or by other uh, authorities around the world. That is the best thing to do. But I tell you, even if you know you are negative, even if you know that uh, the person next to you is actually negative, there's nothing wrong in complying. If you can't comply with fa wearing face masks, then I don't think you are actually supposed to travel. That is the basic truth. Uh, this matter of preparedness of the airlines, for instance, um, you bring in someone who tested negative because they're supposed to carry your negative results certificate before you board. Yes, so the person tested negative and he comes into the country. Like the story of that evacuee that came into the country and then a couple of days later, having gone to mix with people, I mean, he's come back home, oh, you're back and all of that. Discovered that he's actually positive. How do you deal? What's the guarantee that this might not happen with this opening up for international flights, considering also that the first case was brought into the country. There are two solutions to that. 
First of all, yes, you did mention the COVID test prior to uh, departure from origin. And then the first solution to that is there's a website now it's been set up by NCDC for travelers inbound and outbound out of Nigeria. That website actually, on, it's on NCA's website, the website uh, nca.gov.ng, where they're able to actually log into that website and give, uh, give a declaration. Okay, that just hold it, just hold it there. Yes. We'll take a moment, we'll come back and we'll pick up from the point where they are giving the declaration on the website. We'll look at the effectiveness of that. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're looking at the opening up of the international side of flying in Nigeria. The international airports are, wings of the airport are open for international flights. Tara, you were talking about a declaration that has to be done on a certain website. Is that enough? But let's look at, the, first of all, those coming in and going out have to go to that website and do the declaration. Yes. When? At the airport or before no, the prior to departure. So you actually get your COVID test, which is the PCR test, mm -hmm. done prior to traveling. At least four days. Okay. Prior to your travel. Once you're tested negative on that, then you're eligible to fly. When you, you're, you are negative to fly, you fly. And what your hypothesis, or you, you're saying that the person becomes actually positive upon arrival, there's a seven-day isolation period, which... Once on arrival in Nigeria, there's another test being required. So that helps that process. Then finally, there's a communal trace process. That helps us with the track and trace process. Like I said, we, this is real life. Things, no, there's no perfect system. But uh, what we've seen is the best international practice and best international procedures being put in place to ensure a safe secured travel process. Okay, let's look at that website and let's 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 look at how it works. The website where travelers are supposed to go to declare, okay, that's the website there. Um, so you say when you go to this website, what are you supposed to do? You fill in all your personal details, it's your health declaration prior to departure uh, right a departure of your destination. Okay, and then it uploads, it prints out um, your certain data, things that you have to fill. Yes. Okay. And then when you fill it that goes to the NTA. It goes so to, they, actually, it goes to NCDC. 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 So they have that before you come in. That's correct. And before you travel. Yes. And it, it will be with them days before you come. Exactly. So why is it with them? So that they want a profile on you before you come into That's the country. That's correct. You have, it's, it's good for your... What, what, what if I refuse to give consent for all of this? What, that's where the responsibility part comes in. And being able to track and trace, uh, communal trace of traveling passengers is a key point to actually being able to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Uh, because when we have the contact tracing, we're able to mitigate that spread, make sure that patient uh, is treated so that the, treat, uh, the spread is uh, reduced. Okay, I, Isaac, I, I, this matter of going to the portal, international travel portal, to fill out your data, and then when you come in, there's still the bit of... Um, some kind of um, seven-day restriction, you're kept in a place where another test is done on you. What if I, I, I'm one of those passengers that, listen, I, I don't, I'm not giving consent for any of this. What happens? To be honest with you, I help to get landing permit from Lagos to Canada, US through Wamos Air. Uh, I think one of the few evacuations done from, directly from Lagos to US Canada. And I tell you, there were over 50 passengers that could not fly into Canada and US because they delayed in providing those information. As a matter of fact, the flight was delayed from Lagos to Canada, US for 24 hours because of this same information Ogatayo is talking about. So basically, is something that is a responsibility on, this, on the part of the passenger because you cannot expose yourself and expose others. If you are careless, if you're not serious, I told you, during that flight, the people in charge for contacting the passengers did everything possible. Some passengers were not responding. Some were not even on the phone. On the day of the flight, they weren't allowed to board. Simple. They have their US citizenship or Canadian uh, permanent residency and whatever, but they were not allowed to fly into Canada. We had serious, we had six hours delays on ground because of that. So I can tell you that it's a serious matter. If you're coming into Nigeria, and you don't want to go to NCDC and fill up this information, 
I don't think you will have issues. You will have issues with the carrier. And you can see that the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority, the Nigerian government in general, is threatening. If you violate, if any international airline violate all those protocols, you know, you don't follow those protocols, there, there are sanctions. So the best thing is if you're flying, like I said, these are tough times for everybody globally. But if you must travel, you must comply. It's very, very important. Because we don't want you to land and then after some days you have issues. You see, if, if there are issues, people should be able to trace you. There are situations at the early stage of this uh, evacuation flight where people came in and nobody could actually locate them. So these things is a must do. And I think we should please comply and obey the rules. Okay, we've been joined by, I'm coming back, sorry. Let, let's look at a tourism consultant and see what he has to say. If it's Tobo Awana joins us via telephone. If it, these, um, this whole opening up of the aviation sector, um, airlines with all manner of restrictions, how, how is it affecting the tourism industry? Okay, good morning and thank you for having me. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, really, uh, it really has a devastating effect on the, the tourism industry in Nigeria. Uh, however, the important thing is life, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, excited about the way you know uh, we're going about this. Uh, over the past uh, over the past few weeks, uh, there's been a lot of engagement with the travel trade. You know, to keep us up to speed about what government is doing and, uh, you know, how we can jointly you know, uh, surmount all of these challenges. I mean, uh, on Thursday, for example, there was a meeting uh, held by the NCA and other uh, agencies with, with travel trade and airlines that lasted up to about 11 years. You know, so whilst we know that this has a um, very serious effect on our businesses, you know, a lot of uh, uh, businesses in the tourism industry have folded up, I mean, and I'm sure that by the time things open up, we'll see a lot more who, you know, will not be able to open up. But then we know that the most important thing is staying alive, you know, and protecting our people from uh, the dangerous uh, virus. Still staying with you. Uh, first, just sent in a uh, message here. It says, now that international flights have resumed, FG must not hesitate to bring national control measures, even at short notice, if there's risk to Nigerians. Um, I know he's talking to the federal government, but what about the states where these airports are located? Should there be any risk whatsoever? Do you think there's that, um, uh, how do I put it now, the impetus to ensure that immediate um, lockdowns are put in place to stop whatever that might be, just in case there's a threat? I didn't, I, I didn't get that clearly. Yeah, are you talking about the states now? Including the states and federal government. Should there be a threat to Nigeria? Do you think there's that promptness? There'll be that promptness to put back those restrictions as quickly as possible? Well, I, I, I'm sure that with all of the uh, all of the structure that's been, all of the framework that's been put in place by the federal government, I'm sure that there will be the... Uh, it will be possible to, to, to lock up if, if, there is, if there's a threat once again. Uh, and that's why uh, for, for many of us, we're quite optimistic because uh, we see that a lot of work is being done and a lot of um, proactive measures are being taken. Uh, we hope that, you know, there may be, it could be better because, of course, uh, when we look at what some other countries around us are doing, uh, like Ghana, for example, who, you know, are having um, tests at, at the airport, and so it allows the uh, uh, tourists to come in. Because, of course, one of the major things, you know, that one of the major um, consequences of having this uh, seven-day self isolation uh, procedure is that a lot of people will not uh, choose to travel, you know. Uh, for example, the, the Heathrow Airport is down by 78%, by 88%, you know, the, by, um, you know the, just because of the, the self-isolation measures in the UK. So, yes. Those are the considerations. However, just like I said earlier on, the most important thing is life. So even though we want to uh, open up, we want to, we want to also err on the side of caution. Okay. Um, Tayo, I'll bring it that discretion to you. How quickly do you think restrictions can be put back, lockdowns can be implemented again? Should there be any threat whatsoever? 
That's looking like it had a crystal ball. But actually, before I get to that question, there's a punitive, uh, a, a punitive charge for non-compliance to any airline that brings a, a COVID-19 $3,500. Exactly. Per. So, per passenger. So if you choose not to adhere to those uh, restrictions, one, the airline will not pick you, and two, there's that charge if the airline chooses to pick you for one reason or the other. So there's that charge. So it's going to negate it. And that actually brings to your uh, piggybacks to your question. To the, we see a reduced uh, rate of spread. But in the instance, hypothetically, that happens. I, the, the, it's not just uh, uh, the airport. The airport is working along with Lagos State. I know the fund management met with Lagos State uh, Governor during the week on the startup process, as well as the Ministry of Health, Port Health, the Immigration, all the uh, uh, PTF as well. So there is that process for if, if for the challenge instance, the simulation instance that we have a second wave or infection arise. There's a process to actually close down the airport and reduce the travel. Mm. And that's why we're actually having the uh, numbers of travel and number of airports just two for the meantime. Okay. So at the end of the day, we're looking at things that are looking real good. So, gentlemen, if you had a word of advice for all those that are going to travel, um, those immediate travel and later on, what would it be? Let me start with you, um, if it's trouble. What would you say to those who are seeking to travel and tourists who are wanting to come into Nigeria? Uh, so my, my advice would be to follow all of the um, laid down instructions and guidelines because this is uh, for the most important thing which is life, uh, to make sure that you know they, they get tested. I mean, uh, all of the information is out there. And if, they, if they're using, uh, if they're speaking to uh, other travel agents or the airlines, those informations are clearly spelled out where to go to to have those tests, uh, the website to go to to uh, get registered, and the procedures um, to take. So it's important that they follow this because it could mean their own lives. So, and, and, and I don't think there's anything more important, whether it's business or, or leisure, uh, than, than personal life. So uh, once, once they follow all of these, I'm sure that over time we'll be able to overcome this uh, pandemic. Okay. Uh, Isaac, uh, let me put this one to you. The... Those who had bought tickets to travel earlier but could not, some of their tickets were shifted to August. For instance, I know, I know a couple that were supposed to travel in March. They, they bought one of those early tickets that are not too expensive, but they, that means they can't get a refund. And then the airline told them they are losing their tickets. But then the airline, the borders were shut down. And now one of those airlines has been allowed into Nigeria. But the couple can't travel again. So what should those kind of people do? Well, that is quite uh, so unfair. That is not right. Uh, I don't know what class of ticket they bought. You know, sometimes we just buy some of those promo tickets and we don't look at the conditions attached. Uh, I don't know what must have happened. I have, not, uh, I have not been privileged to go through the conditions attached to the ticket that they bought, but it's rather unfortunate. But I know that anybody who is any responsible airline anywhere in the world, you cannot just keep your passengers stranded. People work so hard. I participated in an evacuation flight that currently about 50 people are going to be refunded. You have to refund people back their money or you reschedule them. You cannot just uh, take people's money and say you will not uh, uh, give them a seat when you start flying or you refund them their money. That is very, very important. Uh, it's rather, rather sad, but you know, uh, the question you asked be uh, before now, all I can just say is that Nigerians are patient people. And I pray that we should be more patient. You see, every staff in the airport have been trained by across the aviation agencies, even immigration, customs, uh, the NDLA, all the agencies that are in the airport, the air hostess, the ground support staff, the baggage handlers, everybody has gone through COVID training. You know, we have all complied. So whenever anybody is speaking to you in the airport, please be patient, be patient, Follow the rules, and I think we'll all be happy at the end of the day. I pray that God give us the grace to fight this together because the government can't do it alone. It is also our responsibility as passengers. Tyre. Well, it's just for us to follow the global, uh, global aviation restart protocols so we can actually be safe and ensure that we comply. Mm.
All right. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for sharing t today with us and hoping that th those willing to travel have been listening and would t follow the due protocols. Tayo Oju is an aviation consultant uh, who joined us in Lagos. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac Balami, an aviation consultant, joined us from our studio in Abuja. And we had Ifitobo Awana, who's a tourism consultant, who couldn't make it. I understand he was held in traffic, but he joined via telephone. Thank you, gentlemen. I will wish you well, even as the aviation sector opens up. Thank you again. Sarah's so, right, so will be back in a moment to stay with us. Yeah.